Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. So, we're talking today about what, Brian? What is it? What is the what are the souls we're going to feed? What are the stories we're going to feed those souls? So, this question here from Kelly. Kelly asks, she says, I feel like my own education, she's a mom with kids now. She says, my own education gave me lots of great fiction food. But then when you go Congrats. out. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Good job, Kelly. She says, so I, I feel comfortable there. But when then, when you wax eloquent on historical topics like John Smith or the, all the other ancient historians that we've referenced, I think we've had some of Herodotus. She wants to know, how does one approach that side of reading? The nonfiction mm. side. Because you actually really base your fiction upon yeah, nonfiction. Way, way more than I do on fiction. So the heart, I would, I would say the heart and soul of a lot of fiction is from the fiction you've read. But the particulars, the particulars are from nonfiction, like the references that you do. So there, there are two different ways to talk about this. One is as a reader and one is as a writer. And so as a consumer, you approach fiction one way. And as a creator, you need to approach it in a different way. And so if you are a creator, you want to approach your own craft from the headwaters. You want to get as close to the sources as you can. And what I mean is the sources of inspiration, the sor sources of what has inspired the greats as opposed to the other great writers. I don't want to write novels based on novels. I want to write novels based on the things that inspired other great novelists. So I will riff off of, you know, Tom Sawyer or Treasure Island or stuff that has, you know, that has stood the test of time. Books written by people long dead that, you know, those books have proven to be really valuable minds that yield lots of gold and have influenced culture significantly. So I'll go to those books for inspiration or for typology or template ideas but i'll more often go to mythology or history mm. so the odyssey or herodotus or characters especially for character work or theme i'll go to history and mythology because those are the real headwaters of all story and collective human psychology so the the psyche of a people is more formed at the mythical historical level than at the uh the fictional outworking the fictional, yeah so Rather than trying to just look at the other outworkings, the other incarnations of that social national psyche, I try to get to the, you know, the headwaters of the Nile and, and find those things that, that really inspire great stories. So myths and history deeply influence my writing. When you read as a consumer, it's different. So, you know, you're, you're just putting food on the table and you're trying to find good wholesome reflections of, you know, classic, you know, classic story types and courage, self-sacrifice, stuff mm -hmm. like that. You're looking for those good themes. Yeah. So if you're reading for kids, yeah, I think connecting them with their family is key. We've talked about that before, yep. the church family. So trial and triumph or books of, you know, just things that introduce them to real people in history that have. So if you want to write novels, you want to write novels and you want to write novels like 100 cupboards and the dragon's tooth and that laws of time then what you should do is you should read the voyage of the contiki and you should read jeffrey of monmouth and you know you should read the venerable Bede and herodotus and maybe yeah, thucydides some thucydides it's good to be familiar with thucydides <laughs> but you won't get the same inspiration from him if you like reading stories aloud, you're going to browse at a different level than if you're going to get good at digging deep holes and pouring concrete. So if you're building houses, you have to start by digging a deep hole, getting down to that structural cl clay or bedrock and pouring concrete and building foundations. You want to get all the way down to where it's, it's solid. This is where you can build, pulling in those influences, knowing history, knowing the history of places, knowing the history of a people. You want to know the story of Prester John, you know, the actual story of Prester John. I'm not reading, as I write Ashton Burials 4, I am not reading the other novelizations around Prester John. I'm reading old 
stories about Prester John, uh, the old mythologies, and so on. So, I mean, that's what I do as a writer. If you're talking about a reader, very, very different as a parent trying to find the right dietary choices for your yeah. family, for your kids, or for yourself. I think very, that's... very different than yeah. if you're trying to be a writer. You want to write 100 cupboards? Do not copy 100 cupboards. Don't read 100 cupboards for inspiration. Move beyond that. So, Wizard of Oz is referenced, yes, because it's from a book that has influenced culture by an author who's long dead. You know, it's like, it's from another time. And that's one of the most recent books I would ever reference in anything I do. Mm -hmm. So, most of what I reference is far older centuries. So, Twain is one of the more recent as well. Right. Yeah. And that's a discussion of what makes a classic, what's worth reading. Yeah. And you can tell through the lens of time. C.S. Lewis has that classic essay, uh, the introduction to On the Incarnation, where he talks about the clean sea breeze of the centuries and how that blows through your mind. And if you only read works from your own time, they're going to reinforce your errors or leave you blind, the same blind spots. Yep. But when we look in the past, even nonfiction or history, we know their errors. We know that, say, murdering these innocent people was wrong. And if, if, in the, during the Crusades or during the Inquisition. We know that's wrong. No one's going to yeah. slip that one past us. I, a buddy of mine named Mark Beecham, old friend, gave me a book in college called The Lost Cities of Africa. And that has influenced me as much as any work of fiction. It's just an, you know, it's an archaeological study about various unexplained cities and places that have been found in Africa that have really just no explanation. Mm. Very little gold rhinos found in Zimbabwe and, yeah. th and things like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff like that out there in the world. And those details affect me and affect my storytelling. Do you think exp the explorer genre is key to what it means to be an American? The idea of the frontier? No, I don't. I, I, well, sure. I'll say yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning not exclusively. It's part of us. Because that's yeah. how we got here. Well, I guess the things you're referencing has to, has to do with explorers and frontiersmen. And I just, yeah. I mentioned that because I had a friend who could not understand Hemingway. He was from England. Yeah. And he couldn't understand any of the appeal of Hemingway. And I, on the other hand, could not understand not getting the yeah, appeal Yeah, I think it's probably because of Hemingway's toxic masculinity. No. But it's... <laughs> could be. It could be. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there's a part of it. But the, and I think I mentioned this before, is that the people who didn't leave the people descended from the hobbits that never left versus the people descended from the hobbits that left. There is absolutely a fundamental difference in the, in the mythical fabric of those peoples. Mm. So the stories consumed by and loved by the descendants of the Irish who stayed versus the descendants of the Irish who left, they're both very Irish stories, but there's a completely different kind of uh, aspiration and a different thing honored you know, which, which things are honored, which things are dishonored. Mm. You're talking mythological stories like Tooks versus Bagginses. <laughs> some of, yeah, but some of that, but also just think, okay, so if you tell a story about set in Ireland right now, you go, you go set a love story in the hills of Ireland and there's this kid and he's inherited the farm that's, you know, eight generations in his family. Should he leave? Yeah, there's a lot of weight there. I mean, no, it's just, ba just not. Baked, baked in. It's just immediately no, like, no, not. as part of this whole mythical fabric of that story immediately is no, don't go, stay. Yeah. If don't he leaves for the, the city, farm. he leaves for America. Don't lose the farm. Don't lose the farm. Someone's going to try to buy it. Yep. Yeah. And then we jump over and we've got Irish cop stories of, about the ones who left. And we've got stories about people on the frontier who are Irish, who are actually scraping out a bit of ownership for the first time in their, in their family since forever. And, mm. you know, and there's, there's all sorts of, there's, there's just a lot of variation and they're both, they can, you can have two, two fundamentally Irish stories. They can both be fundamentally Irish, but also fundamentally different mm. because one is woven into the track of the Irish who left and one, you know, the diaspora and one of the Irish who stayed. And so, it kind of, it just breaks in different directions. And so I think there's ways in which, yeah, you can say it's fundamentally American to explore and to go and to wander and to hunt, but that's, we're downstream from, from the people who did that, from 
Yeah. All the people from Slovenia and all the Jews who did it from Eastern Europe and right. all the, you know, all the Irish and all the English and all the French and everybody, <laughs> the Dutch and all the people who mm -hmm. left and adventured and whether it's survival or persecution or colonialism, there's a ton of different stories or whether it's you're the son of the, you know, of the criminals who got thrown <laughs> onto the beaches of Australia. Right. There's a lot of different frontier stories and a lot of different variations on that. So, and, it, and even there, right there, that's a great little pin to say, know your history. Because there's so, a lot of Australians who are. Know your history. Because the, if you read your history, you learn a lot more about how to build narrative than you ever will from a human narrative. Mm. So. Okay. Anyway, that kind of, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. I mean, the, the answer as an adult looking for what history to read is read what you want. Yeah, read right? what you find the most interesting and yeah. read read to those places where you feel the most gapped mm -hmm. and don't feel the emergency of trying to fill all the gaps at once. You just fill a gap and then right. move on because right. we all feel gapped because we are all gapped. None of us are omniscient and we're all totally futile in our pursuit of that omniscience. Yeah, Christy was just reading The Great Hard Time, that book about the depression that I think mm. has been going around. That was a great hard time <laughs> <laughs> and and uh partly reading that just because it felt like a good reminder of where we came from mm -hmm. our grandparents you know are are growing up during yeah. that and my grandfather moved to nebraska i think i've said this but new moved to nebraska in a covered wagon that's crazy he was in the womb his mom was big pregnant but he was in a covered wagon in the womb and he left nebraska in a buick there you go that's the American dream right there. <laughs> I mean, that is nuts. In, in the, uh, they lived, there was like a sod dugout involved. They lived in a. Right. I think that might've been his, his uh, parents, but I, then they lived in a chicken coop for a while. Yeah. My grandparents in North Dakota, same thing. I was South, might've been South Dakota, but the same thing. They said, great depression. We didn't know we were dirt poor anyway, before and after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, <laughs> there were edges to this depression there. That's more like this thing started and stopped. Like that's. Right. Yeah. Rich people in San Francisco and New York lost money. And that's say the yep. people who made the horrible decision to live in North and South Dakota at <laughs> right. that time in history. They had no difference there. And then eventually made it to Idaho and now colonized the Salmon River, you know? So that's yeah, there people. you go. So they were they, they were totally prepped for that. Yep. And that was a that was a dark thread. That was a pretty dark thread, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't think I think I think Brian is an example of of how uh the sins of the father are only visited to the third and fourth generation. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, yeah, it, grace is, is just introduced into yeah, the system. Yeah, it's, it's so good to look at your own family history. And I heard a pastor once talking about how in everyone listening to the sermon, God reached into your family history at some point and just flipped, turned off, turned yep. off the sin spigot, or at least slowed it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> turned on the grace. Turned on the grace. And yeah. all of a sudden, how cool is that? So anyways, yeah, read the history you want. Yeah. Yes. Read true history. Meaning try to read history written by people who are, do not have a political ax to grind. Yeah. And if you do read something by somebody with a political ax to grind, read something written by somebody with the other political ax to grind as well. So Double. one side seems right until you've read the other. It yep. remains true of world movements and politics. Do not just believe the Ukrainians and do not just believe the Russians. Right. So I had to give up on, well, I tend to pause the book Overthrow, which is all about all the governments that the Americans have overthrown. Since <laughs> I had to pause that book and I need to find some positive empire building. Empire building. Yeah. I think we, it's Herodotus. A, you know, probably Herodotus. <laughs> if, we, if we think that should be one of the topics here, incidentally. So we're doing a and a It's just sort of turning into a q and I've episode. got enough to do it. I, I like teasing people. A Q&A episode, <laughs> but uh, we should do one on empires because I am 100% supportive. <laughs> let's do it i am all the way pro colonialism pro empire those are not dirty words just like lots of other things there are good empires and there are bad empires we got to do an episode on that that's fun yeah that'll be okay. great yeah it'll be wonderful okay okay on, next question yeah next question is a hot dog a sandwich <laughs> from jess evans <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you jess well then what would henry york say i guess the, the question and uh no it's a gambler obviously yeah. there you go there are, i got out of it nice perfectly and if you don't understand that you need to read more history and one undercovers
and 100 copies. <laughs> but they've already all read that. Okay, here's a question from Libby. Since you've really stressed how absolutely fundamental to the evil thread, the mixing of fleshes is that we're talking about yep. in, in the Noahic era. And here we are again. And, <laughs> and here we are again. But Libby wants to know, how come it's okay in fiction then to have like half human, half animal creatures like Tumnus or things? It's not. Okay. Why not? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because yeah. that's not what Tumnus is. Tumnus is 100% a fawn. Okay. So he's not, um, he's not the product of you know, a goat and a human mother. There you go. There is, in fact, a type of creature called fawn. And there's a type of creature called centaur. But that's not the result of crossbreeding. Okay. Yeah, so if we go minotaur back to myths again. A minotaur is, in fact, a result of crossbreeding, which is why it's evil. Evil to the ground. Yep. Yeah. Kill it immediately on sight. Right. Now, so, yeah, okay. Historically, a fawn is not biologically an entity meaning like fawns in our own world are not biological like a hippo is they are real uh, but they're the physical manifestations of a spiritual being and i think that lewis knew that but he in narnia was making them a you know a physical being but so fawns are just a, a physical representation of something a kind of a kind of low low level imp a low level demon so the uh, philosophical, not necessarily, yeah, not necessarily yeah, okay. fallen or unfallen. That's just the physical presentation of it. When you, when you see it on this earth, it is not the result of crossbreeding. Okay. So the, the philosophical sin that we're looking at is not the fact that there's a creature that exists that doesn't exist here. Right. The philosophical sin is the, the interbreeding. The actual and so you mixing. see this and you read, look in the old Testament, you look at the description of uh, cherubim and seraphim, you know, uh, those are, that's not the result of crossbreeding. Yeah. A bull with wings. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. You know, it's like, okay, so this has, you know, a human face? What are, what are we doing here? Where was the, you know, human ancestor? Like, no, it's not what this is. So, okay. same deal with a fawn. Gotcha. And would you, do you think fawns are a demonstration of one of the seven angel types? Is that what you're saying here? Or you think it is demonic? I think they're lower than that. And I think it's not necessarily demonic. I think a lot of them are. Oh, we're going to get, we need an episode on angelology here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Here's I'm not, what you, I'm not here's, prepped for that one. You here's what I'll me. say as a rule of thumb, rule of thumb, doesn't mean this is true, just as a, a broad rule of thumb. And this is what I, the same rule of thumb I applied to, uh, to dragons. I think it definitely holds true for dragons. It may or may not hold true for fawns, but this is how I apply it. I, as a rule of thumb, believe that about one third of spiritual entities are fallen and two thirds are not. And so when I see a reference in the old testament in isaiah or something else you know somewhere else to a fawn translated by our our brave modern translators as wild goat mm -hmm. <laughs> but or hyena right yeah fawn yeah. Yeah. a fawn it's a fawn <laughs> when you see a reference in the bible to a fawn i i think okay we're talking about a spiritual being and i think we're talking about some of them are still obedient to the father who made them and some of them are rebellious and following lucifer so I, I put the general line at two thirds. Good. Okay. One third bad. Lewis. Is that grabbed from, Milton grabbed that from somewhere too. You're grabbing from the same place? Yeah, just one third of the host of heaven was, was rebelled and was thrown down. Okay. But then L Lewis does it a little differently. And so he's, he puts the ratio as far more deviant on earth because he has the silent planet. And so it's more earth fell. And so. When that host of heaven was thrown down, they were thrown down where? They were thrown down to earth. So earth is, is kind of the prison for all the fallen. Okay. You know, the prison for all the fallen angels and all the fallen spiritual entities. And that's why we have a high, you know, a high ratio. That could be the case. I think there's aspects of that that are pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter to me, really. But we do have so Michael. We, Michael's been fighting since the time of Paul in on this planet, you'd think he'd made some progress. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes. But so it's not, it's not about, uh, I don't buy Lewis's, I, I love it in fiction. I don't buy it in actuality that there's a boundary preventing characters like Michael from being here. You know, the deep heaven coming down, which is what, what Lewis does in that hideous strength. I love it in that hideous strength. I do not think it is actuality, nor did he. So 
I think that the faithful host of heaven has been free to operate here in a way that Lewis does not utilize in the space trilogy. So I do think that we have the numbers and we have the success and we're winning. And I do think there are more faithful fawns than there are unfaithful fawns. Mm. But I couldn't prove that. It just that just happens to be the the belief I have based on my rule of thumb, which may or may not prove to be correct. Another question: I had someone really doubting that seraphs are dragons. Yeah, and uh, I don't know that they'd listen to our last episode where we discussed that. But where are we going for that? Okay, so all that means is, what is a dragon then? It's I'm going to be happy to say spirit dragon. You know, like this okay. is a supernatural dragon. This is a non-biological, didn't hatch out of an egg dragon. Mm. You know, a dragon of light, a star dragon. Okay. You know, I'll do something like that for you, but it's a dragon. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's reptilian. It's winged. It's super magic and powerful. I mean, like, where do we get the the re- the scales, the reptilian aspect? We should let's let's save this and do a whole let's do a whole serif. Okay. Episode. Let's All put right. a, let's tease this one. There let's, we go. let's tease that one, and let's do a whole cherubim seraphim thing and okay. we'll get we'll get into more of the um angelology angelology crossbreeds monsters <laughs> monsters good and bad all that stuff because that'll be fun and that's a whole big thing that would take the rest of this one and let's do other questions okay here's a question about hg wells from serenity i don't okay. know if this needs to be a separate question as well no we can get through him quickly okay c.s lewis read hg wells we've all read hg wells he mentions god at the end of the war of the worlds uh, occasionally good for him um what's he doing with that yeah i think well i could be a little cynical i think what he's doing is throwing a bone <laughs> throwing a bone to the to the crowd yeah because he's writing before the world had turned <laughs> yeah, the fiction he's... world had turned against mention of god yep i think he's weaning weaning the population from a particular worldview over time and he, th- he throws and probably himself too but just throws in a little reference to you know belief well, there's the truth also that materialist fiction is pretty darn boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you don't elevate so, to the human experience. If, if somebody writes believe on a piece of paper and tapes it over a door like Ted Lasso does in a locker room and everybody just keeps pointing at it, just believe. Like, you know, there's supposed to be an object of belief, right? You're supposed to believe in something. You're, what are we talking about? It's like, well, it's just a, it's a little placebo. It's a little bone thrown to an audience and i think that's what wells is doing there yeah. just throwing a little bone to the audience of his day yeah okay well well that's pretty easy for that i don't buy it is another way of saying it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then another question brother brother niffy has a talk on a rooftop about Ashtown, yes ashtown theology good old brother niffy and you have er, wise beyond with- his years brother niffy with his irish flag boxers right a great character and mohawk. Yes. Have your sons wanted mohawks ever? Uh, my sons have sported mohawks before. Okay, okay so they've, they've worn them. Yes. What, what's the context for a mohawk? <laughs> <laughs> the context for that mohawk has been, hey dad, can I have a mohawk? <laughs> As I'm shaving their heads because when they were little, it was always just buzz. You know, it was like, like just lazy father haircut. We're shaving your head off. And I'd say, sure. Because it was spring break or summer vacation and or there was three more weeks till we were back in school or something like that and we didn't have to shave it all the way off until school started nice so there's some gap before we're not we're not allowed to have outlandish hair at school something i support by the way as a board <laughs> member <laughs> so i'd let them have outlandish hair just to kind of sport it a little bit on breaks nice so yeah they've loved mohawks but niffy had himself a good one yeah. Okay. Well, you can pass on this question if you want, but can you explain more about the theology of Ashtown? Okay. Specifically what? What are we talking about? I don't know. Unfortunately, that's all I've got from the question. Brother Niffy's talk on the rooftop, Ashtown theology. I thought, well, Ashtown theology, you've been explaining it. I mean, Ashtown uh, theology it's, is, it's is yours. Just, it's, is, yeah. <laughs> it's just good theology. Right. Ashtown theology is just correct theology. I think, I don't know of any theology on that rooftop speech I don't agree with. So, self-sacrifice, uh, fearlessness, uh, you have to be willing to die. And if we said, actually, just as a practical technique in that particular moment, if the instant you 
refuse to fear. You take you take one of the uh, you don't fear death. You take one of the biggest weapons away from your enemy. So you're up on the rooftop and you have Niffy saying good and true things. One of the things I've told my boys often is you have to be in a death match before the other person. The first person to know they're in an existential fight usually wins. Okay, what do you mean by that? The person who is escalating slowly, is easing their way into an existential war, is deeply disadvantaged. So the opponent who's able to get to 100 fastest is, is the one who has the advantage. The opponent who does not give a rip whether or not they survive the encounter is the one who has the advantage. Okay, does this apply to all of your speech? Most conversations you have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. I just- I mean, said- yes, there are ways. There are ways in which it applies. But so Niffy is basically saying our goal was never to live. Our goal is not to, our goal is not to live. Our goal is to love. That's the famous line. You know, like that's, uh, and they can't take that from you. So the instant you're afraid, You've, you've weaponized your enemy. You cannot fear death at all. So there are these moments in my books that I'm always a little surprised that they, they pop out and live in odd ways and they live out of context and they live in places way beyond the story and nobody knows that it's a Mohican Irish monk. And I shouldn't say Mohican, Mohawk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different. I, I, I like thinking of people with Mohawks as Mohicans, even though that's inaccurate. And I did for years. Spiritual. For absolute years, I thought of, I actually believed that. And then was very disappointed to just learn, no, that that's actually just a Mohawk Indian, not a Mohican. <laughs> Mohicans didn't actually have Mohawks. That is disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for ruining that yeah. for all of us. <laughs> yes. So last of the Mohican, different thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's weird to me that Niffy's speech has showed up in lots and lots of places, as has one of Fat Frank's speeches. From Daniel on Fire. And they are speeches that matter. There's extensions of my nonfiction. There are things I believe. I don't always have a one to one correlation with believing everything that the characters are saying. I mean, Niffy is coming from a place and a theology that I don't share everything he believes. That's fine. That particular speech of our goal is not survival. Like our goal can never be survival. That's something that matters to me a lot. And that's something that Christians have forgotten. Our goal is not safety. Think about the last year and a half. If Christians had just realized that our goal is not actually to be safe, mm. like all these appeals to safety uh, would have not worked as much. If we'd all listened to Niffy when he said, you know, we can't fear death. Uh, when we don't fear, we take away one of our enemy's biggest weapons. We just, it's gone. Think about how easily motivated by fear we've all been as a culture and as a church last year and a half and it's been super depressing so you take away fear as a as a weapon from your enemy you take away simply living as a goal your goal is to love and to be faithful christ's goal was not to live neither should ours be so it's as simple as that and that's that is the through thread of the theology of ashtown that comes out over and over and over again your goal is never to survive any war or any encounter, any one encounter. Any encounter might be the time you are called on to be done. And you have to be willing for that to be the case. So that's what you mean by, but how does that work in a conversation about existential, an existential conversation? Do you mean that when you're talking to an- I don't even mean existentialism. If I I was confusing there, I mean existential as in existence. Like it's an, like this is an existential fight, meaning one of you is going to cease to exist. So oh, okay. like if you have political factions and you go into a boardroom and one of these factions is thinking a uh, one of these factions is going to cease to exist after <laughs> like existence is on the table and non-existence is on the table. Coexistence is not on the table. Whichever, oh, okay. whichever side is thinking coexistence is on the table is disadvantaged. Whichever side is thinking there can be only one, <laughs> it has the advantage going into the fight. I mean, as Christians, that's how we approach it all, right? Yeah, that's absolutely the, whole, the case. The there can be ours. only one. Okay. So there can, there can be only one ruler. There can be only one God. There can be only one king. And if we approach everything in a, in a gradually escalating, in a gradual, gradually escalating fight where we, we get to a place where we say, hey, I, you know what? I think these worldviews aren't compatible. I think these factions aren't compatible. 
Well, the other side's known that for a long time, which is why you're losing. Mm. You know, they're, they're fighting at 100 while you're still easing yourself up past 85. You know, for basically the first antagonist is the first antagonist to 100 is at the advantage. So, villain or hero, the first person to know it's a death match has the advantage. And that's something that I, I play with throughout the Ashdown books. Nice. Thanks for listening. This has been Stories for Soul Food, episode number 49. 49. That's correct. This is the grab bag episode. The grab bag, one of many grab bag episodes with Andy Wilson and Brian Cole. Brian Cole. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out Trial and Triumph, Stories from Church History by Richard Hanula. Order today at canonpress.com.